And I had to look at it recently. I had to let go of property management company and I had to really reflect and go, okay, I can sit here and blame the property management company and sit here and say that that was, it was their fault. They did things wrong and that's why the property, but ultimately it's my fault. It falls on my shoulders. I am the leader. I'm the asset manager. I am, you know, the main owner, or sorry, I shouldn't say main owner, but the general partner of this property. And it falls on me. So what were the decisions I made that led to the failure of the property management company? It is a common saying amongst real estate investors that you make money when you buy, not when you sell. While this catchy phrase has value, it fails to convey how easy it is to lose money through poor property management. Whether you self-manage or hire a professional, it is important to understand how to navigate the common pitfalls and challenges with rental properties without losing your shirt or your mind. That's why you have tuned in to Maximizing Your Property Value, the apartment owner's guide to operating rental properties as a successful business. I'm your host, John Stiles, real estate agent and team leader of the VIP Real Estate Group at Bridge Realty. As a current multifamily investor and former property manager myself, I understand the headaches and difficulties of keeping an investment property from becoming a money pit and time sucker. It takes a solid business plan, it takes tested systems, and it takes key team members to actually find success. So let's take a deep dive and maximize your property value. All right, welcome back everybody to another episode of Maximizing Your Property Value. Today we're gonna to take a little bit of a detour uh, from our normal uh, discussion and we're gonna do a, a quick book review. So I'm pleased to have my friend here, Todd Dexheimer. Todd, how you doing today? I'm doing fantastic, John. Thanks for uh, having me. For sure, we've, as uh, our listeners know, you were monumental in starting up this show. If you go back to episodes one through about five, and uh, so I appreciate having you back on. Yeah, we, I, I, and I got to get into your studio to, uh, to do a, a live interview. That'd be fun to do. Yeah, yeah I, know, sure. I know I've said I'm going to do it, and I still am. I just have to uh, make the time to actually go do it. <laughs> for sure. So, and, uh, so if anybody doesn't know, Todd has his own show, Pillars of Wealth Creation. You should definitely check it out. Um, but today, we're just going to do a quick book review on... Um, the book Extreme Ownership, which was written by Jocko Willink and Leif Babin. So we just finished this book. It's going to be a great one for you to add to your collection. So here's a couple of takeaways that we had from it. What did you think of the book? I liked it a lot. Um, it's definitely you know, intense, right? Those guys are very intense. For sure, yeah. Ex-Navy SEAL guys, I guess you would only expect them to be intense. I read uh, or listened to David Goggin's book. Um, uh, I can't recall the name, but I'll, I'll, I'll look it up and, and think about it. He's a Na Navy SEAL too. And same thing, very intense. So that's what you expect from the Navy SEAL. Yeah. Yeah. There some great stories uh, throughout the book. Almost wants you, almost makes you want to go and uh, watch a, a good war movie um, <laughs> after the fact. Yeah. Can't hurt me is the David Goggins book. And I thought that was excellent as well, but a lot of just stories, but very intense. And these guys, <laughs> uh, you know, Jocko and Leif are, are very intense as well. So yeah, yep. a lot of good stories, uh, war stories. I did feel at times I got a little disconnected from the book, listening to the war stories and like being like into the war stories, but yet not really relating to them to the topic they were talking about uh, at times, but you know, it was still entertaining. Yeah. Well, and, and I really appreciate when r authors can use stories to, to make a point because I felt they did bring it back. Um, maybe you didn't understand it at first, yeah. um, but they did bring it back. They did apply it. They did bring out principles from their experiences. And so that was really important. Yeah. Yeah. The overall, just so people know, the overall kind of topic of the book is extreme ownership and it's about owning your mistakes. It's about owning the responsibilities. And look, if you are the leader, if you're a true leader, it's nobody else's fault, but your own. You have to take responsibility. And I had to look at it recently. I had to let go of property management company. And I had to really reflect and go, okay, 
I can sit here and blame the property management company and sit here and say that that was, it was their fault. They did things wrong and that's why the property, but ultimately it's my fault. It falls on my shoulders. I am the leader. I'm the asset manager. I am, you know, the main owner, or sorry, I shouldn't say main owner, but the general partner of this property. And it falls on me. So what were the decisions I made that led to the failure of the property management company? And, you know, when I look back at it, I, I had to, had to really realize that I probably didn't set them up for as much success as what I could have from the very start. And when you don't start out right, you typically don't, you know, it's hard, it's hard to trend in the right direction. So I didn't have a lot of the checks and balances in place. I don't think I portrayed my vision to them as, as well as I needed. I don't think I it really pressed upon them of the importance of getting some of these renovations done early and often. I would rather have them sit vacant than not be ready when people do want to rent. Uh, we ran into that and that was a big part of some of these problems and the hiring. And so there's just a lot of different problems that came about with this management company. That ultimately, I said I had, to, I had to move on with them. But when I look at it, that was my fault from the beginning of not setting them up for the success that I wanted and envisioned. Um, so, so yeah, I think that was the overarching kind of, you know, theme of the book is look, you, you have to take ownership uh, and you're going to have, not only is that going to help your success, but it's going to help your entire team's success as well. Yep. And I, I think it just uh, really goes against what our natural inclination is. Our natural tendency is to blame everyone and everything around us. And what was really kind of eye-opening for me in this book is that it's not just people who are maybe underneath you that you're in charge of, but it's also people to the side of you. It's also people above you. And whatever the situation is, you need to make sure that your yeah, colleagues understand the situation a way, you know, the way best to work together. The, your boss, uh, you know, if you're self-employed, maybe, maybe you don't have a boss, but there's, um, for me, for example, in, um, I'm a real estate agent, but I'm part of a brokerage. So there might be some things that I might not like about the broker, what he's doing, but I can't just sit here and think, well, you know, if they would only do things differently, then I would be successful. Well, maybe I need to communicate this stuff with the broker and you know, you have to give feedback up and down the chain of command. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, and ultimately if you're a business owner, you do have a boss, it's called your clients, right? Sure. And yep. If you're not making money, well then you got to decide what you got to take ownership. You got to decide what you're doing wrong. Is it your marketing or maybe it's, it's how you're reacting and acting with your clients. I mean, somehow it's, it's because your boss is not, you know, either doesn't know who you are or doesn't like who you are, or, you know, doesn't hear from you enough or whatever it is, but ultimately uh, it's, it's your own responsibility to figure that out. Whether, you know, you're, working for a company or whether you are the, the head of the company. Yep, for sure. So yeah, the, I mean, one of the theme, one of the things they talked about was there's no bad teams. There's only bad leaders. So a lot of times you might blame the team. Um, they gave the example of, you know, seals going through their, um, I forget the exact name, but you know, their seal training. Um, and they had these different teams in there and, and they, put a lot of pressure on whichever team is falling behind, whichever team is last. You do not want to be last in the, in this training. Um, and yeah. they ended during, up during hell week, right? They call it hell right. week. Right. Um, so they ended up changing the leaders from the best team and the worst team. And it, it all came down to the leaders, you know, the best team still did really great, even with the worst leader, you know, yeah. um, because they were originally trained by a really great leader. And that worst team became really great because they were, you know, had a, a new great leader. So it came down to the leadership there. Yeah. I really liked that example. What was it? The, were they carrying boats or something and running yep. and, and yep. you know, the, the team that was always coming in last place and had this leader that was just badgering them and wasn't doing a good job leading 
um, they were always coming in last. And then there was another team that was always coming in first and had a, another really st- had a strong leader and they switched the leaders and the team that was coming in last, they did, they went, they won that. Right. Or maybe they, they either came whatever. first or second. They were, yeah. really- it, it was just like, wow, that's uh that's pretty crazy to think like that little bit of change sometimes can make a big difference. And it's all about that leadership. It's not like the people were, were somehow worse it was that the leader wasn't doing what they needed to do they just blamed everybody else yep yeah um what other takes did you have from the book anything else um i you know i think like i mentioned it's just um it's i think before i was thinking in terms of just leading down the chain of command and whoever i'm uh maybe hiring or um, whoever's in my team, I need to make sure they are uh, doing what they should. And and obviously that's a good part of it, but um, then looking outwards uh, and upwards, uh, I think that was a really big eye opener for me. Explain what that means, uh, looking outwards and upwards. Yeah. So the people who, um, so he, he gave the example of two different uh, divisions of a company where they're they're basically separated, but they they rely on each other, mm-hmm. um, and so uh, one of them you know was dissatisfied with the service provided by the other, and so what did they do? They just complained and they're like, oh, they're such a terrible company or division, you know, and they're not doing what they should be doing. Well, when they went through this training that uh, you know the authors offer um, about extreme ownership, then they they gain a new, um, you know, perspective that even though it's a different division, pretty well separated, you know, it is the same company with them. And so that means they have the same goals. They're all trying to, um, you know, make money for the company and be successful. Um, so instead of bickering and instead of blaming, they can, um, you know, talk to each other, meet with each other, see uh, what, ways they can help each other out um and he also uh going back to the military and um you know there's different branches in the military obviously um and they have to work alongside each other um and there's times when um you know one one branch or one person might want to tell the other what to do but they can't they're not in authority but they can use influence and they can build relationships and they can have understanding um so that when it comes time where they really want to get their point across, um, they can, you know, they can do that effectively. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and that happens, you know, in businesses a lot when you have mergers, um, you know, or, or just a new acquisition of, of some sort. And, you know, people have different expectations. The company was run a certain way. And now this new company takes over uh, new leadership, whatever. And we have some, some budding of heads. Um, the, the, I, what I thought, uh, was interesting. I can't remember the exact number. I think they, they said, you know, you can't effectively lead a large team. Um, and they, they said basically, you know, you're, you're only going to be effective at leading. I think it was like five to 10 people. It, it was a fairly small number. And beyond that, you need other people to then to lead. So you have to have tiers, you have to have steps. Um, you can't just, assume that you can lead a a large team of 30, 40 people and be effective at it. So I thought that was really interesting. And I guess, you know, when you look at uh, companies, you you look at, look at pro sports teams. I mean, you have a head coach, right. And he leads everybody, but does he really lead everybody? Yeah. I mean, kind of, but you also have all these other coaches set up, you know, you have all these assistant coaches and um, you know, different coaches for different positions and, you know, any, any sports, it's very similar. So businesses, sports are all the same. Uh, the leaders are only leading a small group of people. Yep. Yep. So that's, that's just kind of telling for our interpersonal relationships. They, I mean, that's a big part of leadership and uh, you have to be able to understand who you're working with and how they communicate, how they, uh, what their strengths are. And, um, you know, work on those 
What, and what I don't think that means is that if you're, you know, let's say you're building a company that's, that's larger, um, like some of us are trying to do, it doesn't mean that you should be ignoring um, those who you're not leading. You know, it doesn't mean that just because you're the, maybe the CEO and you've got, you know, five or six, you know, managers directly underneath you that you talk to on more of a daily basis doesn't mean you shouldn't communicate with, you know, maybe some of the lower end employees that are, you know, on the floor or whatever in the, in the trenches. That doesn't necessarily mean that. It just means that you're, to, you're really only leading those managers. Um, you still should communicate. You still should be open with the rest of the company. Um, but I think that's an important distinction to make that it doesn't mean that you should just ignore everybody else. Yep. Yeah. There's a lot of value from understanding you know, the boots on the ground perspective yeah. um, and uh, having that influence your decisions at the higher level of how you're operating the company. Awesome. John, anything else? No, I, I mean, I guess I would just say this definitely stays on the list of books that I want to keep and, and revisit. Um, yeah. definitely you can get something in from it each time you go through it. And then it's good to just be reminded and, um, you know, stay in tune with this, this idea. Yeah. A lot of, uh, you know, fairly, fairly simple, um, uh, book as far as just like the overarching, you know, it, taking extreme ownership, uh, in leadership, but a lot of good, valuable points along the way. And a lot of good stories that kind of, it leads you into understanding what they're talking about. Uh, plus exciting stories. If you do like that kind of, you know, war type stories, um, they talk a lot about their, their time over in, uh, you know, over overseas, uh, in, you know, the middle East. So a lot of, a lot of exciting stories there and Holy cow, man, that is just crazy to hear some of that stuff that will that happen and just hard to believe, you know, obviously, you kind of know it, you kind of hear it, but uh, we're so insulated here, especially uh, us in like Minnesota where, you know, we're nowhere near any, <laughs> any real threats. Um, you're just kind of insulated. So. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Well, John, I appreciate it. You have a fantastic rest of the day. Happy new year's to you. Uh, best of luck in 2020. We'll be catching up. Talk to you soon. All right. You too. The opinions shared on this show are for informational purposes only and should not be taken as a solicitation for representation or investments in any specific offering. Please consult with your financial, legal, tax, and real estate advisor before making any investment decisions. John Stiles is a licensed Minnesota real estate agent with Bridge Realty. Thanks for tuning in to Maximizing Your Property Value, the apartment owner's guide to operating rental properties as a successful business. If you're considering scaling up, downsizing, or right-sizing your real estate investment portfolio, it's important to know how to determine your property's value in today's market. That's why I've put together a free ebook for you called How to Calculate Your Investment Property's Value. To get your copy, go to www.realestatestyles.com forward slash value. Now, if you found any value in today's show, be sure to subscribe to our email newsletter, YouTube channel, and podcast through your favorite podcast player. All the links are in the show notes. And would you do me a big favor? Help me get the word out about this show by sharing with your friends on Facebook and LinkedIn. And lastly, we appreciate your five-star rating on iTunes. I really appreciate you and wish you the best in your real estate investing career. Signing off, I'm John Stiles with Bridge Realty. Make it a great day.